I'm just two words to thank uh, really a lot uh, William Nicholson to, uh, to be with us today. To have been uh, this morning, he has done a wonderful class of three hours for a group of people that are here, a group of the master program in screenwriting, uh, telling in a very uh, sincere way uh, the, the good and bad of the work of being, of being uh, a writer, uh, a writer as he is. Uh, he has been uh, working on many, many big projects, uh, Hollywood films, international films, uh, that have been uh, extremely successful all over the world. Uh, I personally love particularly Shadowlands, Viaggio in Inghilterra, and in my opinion is one of the best films of the 90s. <laughs> but as you know, he has been uh, the rewriter of the last two drafts. Uh, uh, maybe he will talk about that also of Gladiator. He has been the writer moving from the musical to the actual film of Le Miserable. He has been the writer of a film about Mandela that we hope it will come to Italy soon, Mandela Long, Long World of Freedom, and uh, many other films, Elizabeth the Golden Age, and in, this, in this case, uh, if I'm correct, it was a writer, Nell, uh, Firelight, in which he has been also director. But uh, he, is, he still uh, writes also for uh, theatre. Uh, uh, he has been writing uh, uh, different uh, theatre plays. Uh, he has published uh, a good number of novels. He's still writing novels. He will have a new novel uh, coming in February of next year. And uh, we are uh, extremely happy to have him here because in uh, all, all his work, uh, when he works for uh, independent films, but also when he works for uh, big projects, I uh, personally am I'm sure to say that I can see a high quality, uh, always, in all these different uh, uh, works that he has been doing, uh, he has given something more uh, a special subtlety, a special uh, um, deepness, uh, especially deep in characters, in themes, uh, that make some of this film, uh, and in some way, uh, all of this film uh, very special, and some of them are really unforgettable. So, um, he has been speaking this morning of, uh, and the, the title of, the, of this uh, uh, class is crafting stories. He has been talking about the craft because uh, uh, the, the work of a writer is made, yes, of inspiration, but also it's a, it's a craft that you have to go on and uh, uh, improve and do it better and better. And uh, he has been uh, telling us in a very interesting ways how his different uh, work in uh, narrative, uh, theater, television, cinema, has been uh, helping him uh, as a writer, and there's a common ground also if it uh, goes with, uh, uh, with different media. So, uh, I'm uh, also eager to hear him uh, also now, and uh, I finished just uh, saying that also one of the reasons uh, we have been uh, asking uh, William Nicholson to be here with us is that uh, as uh, uh, people who try to um, train new writers, we see the English way of writing, uh, uh, English cinema, English television, as a very good uh, uh, example for us, because uh, it's English, and uh, also if they uh, like to be a little bit different, <laughs> they are Europeans. <laughs> And uh, it is for us a very good way we can, I think, I'm sure, I'm convinced we can look at the English way of doing films uh, and of writing and producing also TV series, like a, a very um, higher step, very interesting for us to be uh, also, we as Italians, more international, uh, without losing our characteristics as European uh, writers uh, as a European cinema, European television. So, these are some of, uh, of the reasons, some of the um, 
reasons why we are very happy to have him here, I thank also Professor Arturo Cattaneo, Professor of English Literature, that uh, is, is a, a friend and always help us in thinking these kind of occasions, uh, uh, also in which literature and cinema uh, and television are together. Uh, it's a deep conviction that we have and we share. And uh, uh, thank again to William Nicholson, and uh, we uh, give the word that we hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda. Amanda, well, let's have the clip a little bit later. Okay. Okay. I, I've worked out a place. I've, I'm going to show a little, little clip of Gladiator because it's a film you're probably most familiar with. But I'll explain why before I get to it. Um, I want to start off by saying um, uh, I come to you with a reputation for success and fame and big movies. Uh, so I want to begin by telling you about all the projects I've been involved with and that have failed. And uh, there are a large number of them. I mean, the, the ultimate failure as a writer is to have your work never appear at all. And this has happened to me a lot. Uh, I, I've got some films to my name, but probably over 50% of everything I've ever done is uh, dead and will never reach you. Um, I have had the pleasure of meeting many famous people. Sometimes it's good at occasions like this to drop some famous names because it'll make you think I'm a more wonderful person. So I'm going to do that. Uh, the, the point of telling you these famous names is to tell you that every single one of them let me down. <laughs> I had a um, wonderful project about the Second World War in the Philippines. It was called Ferti, which is the name of the, the main um, uh, character. And that was going to be a film starring Brad Pitt. I remember meeting Brad Pitt. And, he showed me his designs for a hotel, you know, he's uh, interested in being an architect, and that was very impressive. And David Fincher, who was going to direct it, explained to me about the film he was then making, and uh, I was extremely excited to meet these very wonderful people. Um, the film uh, has yet to be made, and this is several years ago. Um, but I, you'll be happy to know I was paid for writing the script. Um, I developed a movie called American Caesar, which Oliver Stone was going to make and Jack Nicholson was going to star in. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud of that script as well. And Oliver Stone told me all about his current projects and uh, I was very impressed by them and how excited he was to direct my, my script. Um, that also has never come to life. Um, I had a long conversation with Tom Cruise about a Second World War movie in which um, I, I wanted to write a Second World War movie and my Second World War movie was about a raid called the Dieppe Raid. Um, and it's a, it's a tragedy, actually. A, a lot of Canadians, 6,000 Canadians, were sent on a, a test for D-Day invasion. And it was a disaster because it was so badly planned. 3,000 of them were either killed or captured. Um, Tom Cruise wanted to be in a Second World War movie. So uh, I was put together with him at Pinewood. And I said, uh, here's my project, and I described it to him. And he said, yes, that's, he was very, very courteous. I said, that's very interesting. He said, but I want to be uh, a Spitfire pilot. I want to fly an aeroplane. And I see this movie, I'm a Spitfire pilot, and the German ace is my best friend, and we're flying against each other. And I said, yes, well, that's, that's very interesting, but that's not the movie I came to tell you about. You see, but can't you just see the battles in the sky? So that went absolutely nowhere. I had a very fine meeting with Will Smith on a project in which I couldn't quite understand why he was so quiet. And in the end, somebody said to me, don't you understand? He has no idea what the project is. He's never read the script. Um, and I was going to write a film for Harrison Ford with a wonderful uh, director called Gonzalez Zinonitu, who made a brilliant film called The yes. Morris Perils. Very fine director, and Harrison Ford, a very fine actor. And it was a very good subject, and I said, Harrison, this wonderful subject, you're going to be the star, and it's going to begin with you captured in Chechnya, and you're dragged out of your, out of your car, and you're taken in a truck, and you're taken to the forest, and they kneel you down in the forest, and they shoot you dead. So three minutes into the movie, you're dead. And then we have the, uh, then the movie begins. And Harrison Ford said, that is so wonderful, that is wonderful, I love it, I love it. And then I didn't hear anything, and I didn't hear anything, I didn't hear. 
and Da Vinci no song, no, you can't tell your hero at the beginning. So, an awful lot of stuff I've done has been a failure. There are other films I've worked on that have been filmed and have failed. Uh, Firelight, my only film as a writer-director, was a failure. It failed commercially and it failed critically, which is very hurtful. It's very difficult to deal with. Um, I just want to say all this to balance the image of glory and success. You don't become a writer for glory and success, or if you do, you're going to have a bad time. So, I just want to step back from Hollywood and ask the question, why do we write at all? Some of you here, I think, are writers, or might be writers. All of you are consumers of the work of writers through television, through cinema, through books, even through the internet. What is this thing, writing? Why do people do it? Now, I can tell you, from the point of view of a lifelong writer, I wanted to be a writer from the age of five. And that gives me the clue. Why did I want to be a writer? My mother was a teacher of English. The house was full of books. My mother was the strongest personality in my family. And I wanted to impress my mother. I think it's very straightforward. We write initially out of vanity. It's a desire to be admired. It's like, here I am, I'm dancing, everybody clap. And that's all right. Things have to start from somewhere. You start with this primitive, egotistical hunger for attention. Because after all, why should anybody be remotely interested in what you've got to say? And that's the challenge. Because they're not. People are not interested in what you've got to say. You have to make them be interested. And as a writer, you start off doing that out of a desire to get attention. But, as you grow older, you begin to realize that writing is something very, very interesting. It's not simply putting words on paper or putting words on a screen. Writing is the way that we take the mess of the life we need and turn it into something orderly, something meaningful. Think of your life. Does it have meaning? Does it have order? Do the good people win and the bad people lose? Are the right people having the richest life and the wrong people down in the gutter? No, clearly not. Clearly the world is an extremely unjust place. The people who get cancer are not the bad people. The people whose children grow up to be the best children are not the best people. It's a mess. The whole thing is a mess and the whole thing is meaningless. If you have faith, and you believe there's a life after, you can make sense of it. Because whatever happens down here is just a trial for what happens up there. Which is why faith is so valuable, so useful, so has lasted throughout the ages. If you don't have faith, and I do not have faith, I was raised as a Catholic, but I slipped away from me in my, in my early 20s. If you don't have faith, you fall back on story. Story is the construction of the events of life in a way that makes them satisfying. And I think it's a very profound human need. We desperately want to believe that things add up, that things make sense. That if a bad guy comes into a bar and kills somebody, that as you follow the story, the results of that action will be visited upon him in some satisfying way. It's why a lot of stories are revenge stories, actually. We're very hungry for punishment. We want the bad to be punished and the good to be rewarded. That need is so powerful that we've been telling stories since time began. And what I do in film and in novels and in plays is the same thing people did around the fire in primitive times. They're telling stories. So don't underestimate the power and the need for stories. If you took stories away, I think we'd all go insane. It's something very, very fundamental. And there's something else that happens when you write, and any of you here who are writers will know this. 
It's a kind of playtime. You're having fun, you're dreaming, you're thinking all sorts of possibilities that don't really exist that you're playing with. I've also written fantasy books for, for children. And it's been such a joy to me to make up these worlds and to make up these people. And I realize that what I'm doing is I'm playing. And we don't get to play very much when we stop being children. Um, so if you're a writer, you're creating stories, you're creating order in the world, you're creating play. These are very, very important, important things. So I want to suggest to you that even if you are not a writer, don't think of writers as some special group of people who do something that you can't do. That's not the case. They're doing something you do already, instinctively. You may not put it down on paper or on a screen, but you do it every time you tell somebody an anecdote, you're becoming a storyteller. So find the writer in you, whether you write or not, and realize that that can grow and you can find ways of taking control of your own understanding of the world through becoming your own author. And that's why when I write and I fail, which has happened to me a great deal, I've learned to deal with it. It's hard, but I've learned to deal with it because I realized that that process of writing, even though it did not end in success, was immensely valuable. Um, just very quickly to tell you how I came into writing, because I think, again, those of you who want to be writers are always interested to know how can you turn from failure to success, which is what I have done. I started out writing books, novels. When I was at university, I had a love affair, and the love affair went wrong, and it was, for me, the most important love affair I'd ever had. I was only 20. And it shattered me. And the only way I knew how to deal with it was to write about it. So I wrote a great novel about my failed love affair. And I then realized it wasn't good enough. And I wrote a second novel about a failed love affair. And I got an agent. And I sent it to the agent. And the agent said, this is interesting, but it doesn't work. But you've got talent. Keep working. I wrote six more novels. None of them were accepted. None of them succeeded in any way at all. It's not that they published and failed, they were never published. So I'm eight novels in, and I'm now 34. Not now, but then. I'm 66 now. And I had got absolutely nowhere. Writing every day, obsessed with writing, believing myself to be a writer, and failing. Every time my novels took me about two years to write each novel. Every time my agent said, no, it doesn't work, it was torment, tremendous destruction and pain. So you might say to yourself, why go on? You must be some kind of idiot that it takes you eight rejections to realize you are a talentless loser. But I did keep going. And I kept going because by then it had become a necessity for me to write. However, something else had been happening while I'd been writing these no-good books. I had been growing older and wiser and learning more about life. And I actually believe that writing is about wisdom and you don't get wisdom when you're young. Now, I say that most of you here are young and you're probably a lot wiser than me. And you can prove it by writing an extraordinary book at the age of 21 or 22. Fantastic. I did not manage to do this. It's taken me a long time. But what I have done throughout that long time is kept writing. So I do say to any of you who want to be writers, get that discipline. Work every day. But don't work all day. Very important. I work in the mornings. By lunchtime I've had enough. After that, it's time to go shopping, <laughs> or lie on a sofa, or see my kids, or listen to music. If you're a writer, the process of writing is the process of reflection and digestion of your life. You can't reflect and digest your whole life, or you'll end up not having a life. You'll end up digesting yourself. So you have to have a life. So if you are writing and you are failing, 
take this consolation. You're living. Failing is still living. Failing is very good subject matter, by the way. Most of us fail. Write about failing. But give yourself time to do the living. Give yourself time to do the failing. So, I do believe, as you can gather, that writing is a therapy, a growth process, a maturing process. It's something, it's immensely important and valuable, even if nobody ever reads or sees a single thing you do. You will be a deeper, wiser, kinder person if you write, because all writing means is reflecting, thinking about what happens to you. Most people are so busy, they're moving so fast, that they don't take anything in. If you're a writer, you do take things in. And that makes you, eventually, a wise and wonderful person. Um, now, I just say a little bit about what I think good writing is. Um, this is important for those who want to be writers. The first word that I've written down on my little scribble of notes, which may surprise you, is entertainment. If you're going to write for other people, you don't want to bore them. You want to give them something that pleases them, because otherwise why are they going to bother with it? Um, it's not the fashionable way to approach. It doesn't sound as if it's important enough, but it is. If it's going to entertain, that means you have some idea of how your audience is receiving your work. I would say that the greatest error made by bad writers is they are not attentive to how their work is being received. They're attentive to themselves. They're caught up in themselves. They feel they have something to express. They wish to speak with their own voice and they haven't stopped to say, who's listening? Do they care? Are they hearing anything? You must get feedback on your writing, otherwise you're just a mad person in an attic talking to yourself. So entertainment, that's my word that means you're reaching people, you're giving them something they want. The same thing about good writing, it has authority. You feel as you read or as you watch the film that these people know what they're talking about. How can you achieve that? You've got to work at it, you've got to learn stuff. A good writer knows a whole lot of stuff. And when I was young and writing all my really bad novels, I did not know anything. So of course they were bad. So that's another reason why I believe very strongly in getting older. By the way, here's the good news. I guess I'm older than everybody in this room. The good news is it gets better. Better and better and better. When you are in your 20s, life is absolute hell because you're tormented by fear. You're afraid you're not attractive, you're afraid you won't be successful. You're afraid that other people are better than you in every way, and you pretend it's not true. But of course, they're all pretending it's not true as well, and you believe their pretense, and they believe your pretense. So everybody ends up in a state of panic. <laughs> you get a little bit older, you start to find what you can do, you start to get a bit good at it, but it's still very tough, and you probably haven't yet found Mr. Right or Miss Right, and you're panicking about that. There's so much to worry about, and you're still very unsure of yourself. Let me tell you, this goes on till you're about 50. When you're 50, it starts to get better. When you're 60, it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm 66, and it's still getting better. So until bits of me drop off, I think it's going to be very, very good. You start to worry less about what people think about you. You're more relaxed. You feel more confident in yourself. You're more forgiving. At your age, you're very self-critical. You're very perfectionist. You insist on being wonderful. Well, you're not going to be wonderful. Give up on that one. But you might be all right. And that's what, when you get old, you discover. So, that, I mean, just take that for me. Your life is a great joy to come even if it isn't right now. So, the third thing that I think I find from good writing, and this is special to me, I don't think many people would agree with that. I mean, the noble professors around me might not say this. I said nothing about style, you notice? Not a single thing about how you construct your sentences. I'm talking about what's in what you're saying. And the third thing for me is the value system that you put out when you write. Everything I write, whether it's Shadowlands or Gladiator, 
or my own film Firelight or my novels conveys to other people the values that I hold dear. Not because I write speeches for the characters to speak, but because I, those values are deep in me and as I construct my stories without even realizing it, I am conveying those values. And just to give you a couple of headlines on those values, I believe myself, and this is not a good theological statement, I believe that no people are evil. I believe all people are good and all people are innocent. As babies, let's imagine everybody born as a baby. They're good and they're innocent. Yeah, sure, there are bad people in the world. So what's made them bad? How did they turn into bad people? How did they become monsters, evil aggressors, mass murderers, pedophiles? What happened to them? In my opinion, the answer is they became subject to abuses which caused them to become very afraid, which caused them to behave as they are. Now that's a view of humanity that is fundamentally compassionate. That is what I believe. I believe people are good, and if you create stories that try to show that, you're actually adding to the goodness in the world. Now you do that not by having stories about lots of good people being nice to each other and saying, hi, aren't we good? You create it by making your villains be rounded characters. And what I'm going to do now is ask you to show the clip. And the point about this clip, it's a scene from Gladiator in which the villain, who is Herkin Phoenix, if you remember, who uh, becomes the, the, the emperor, he's about to do something grotesque. He's about to kill his saintly father. Now, there are many ways you could write a scene like this. You could have him creep up behind him and hit him over the back of the head with a cudgel. You could have him get into a fit of rage and beat him to the ground. That is not the way I wrote this scene. So look at the scene and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, Amanda, can we go? Yep. So um, that's a scene uh, which I, I think it's a very powerful scene. Uh, your faults as a son and my failure as a father. Many of us could say that, I think. Um, what I'm trying to do there is to create something intensely dramatic. I think it's quite scary. But at the same time, there's a lot of information there that can cause you to say, I understand why Commodus did what he did. And that process of empathy, of understanding your enemies, understanding those who are not like you, is absolutely, it's crucial, I think, to our future as a civilization, but I think it's also crucial to good writing and to drama. It's not dramatic to have an enormous evil monster jump at you and you manage to kill the evil monster. Because the evil monster has no reality, has no personality, you have no engagement with the evil monster. What you need for drama is engagement with the characters. You have to care about the characters. It's why so many movies, particularly action movies, don't stay with you. For, for more than the time that the music is playing, because you're not engaged by the characters. The, the movie makers think that if there's enough bang bang, you'll be excited. They don't understand that excitement comes from emotional connection. And emotional connection comes from character. And character, knowing character, knowing people, is the heart of the writer's endeavor. What we do as writers is hope to understand how other people work. It's the great joy of writing, it's the great task of writing, in my opinion. Now, you understand I'm talking not in terms of, as I said before, sentence structure, style, film structure. I personally am not interested in any of that the structure of the film may fall apart, but if at the heart of it there's an insight into people that I recognize to be true, I feel my time is not wasted in the presence of that film. Um, this concept of truth 
is a very difficult one, but it's very important. I'm using it loosely. You will have your own sense of what is true and what is not true. They may not all overlap, but our experience is throughout literature, the history of literature, that human beings respond in the same way to the same truths. We are moved by King Lear cradling dead Cordelia in his arms as if it was us here today in the 500 years that have gone by. Nothing has changed in human nature. We are as moved by uh, one of the Greek tragedies so, so long ago as we are today. So that makes me feel there is a constant in human nature and there is a sense we all have of when an emotion is true. If we can present that truth and if that truth makes people more compassionate towards each other, and I think all great literature, great films, I want to say great art, tends towards compassion. We're doing something of enormous importance. And even if you're not a writer or a creator in this narrow sense, as a consumer, you should be seeking this constant deepening of your understanding of the other, of that which is not you. I mean, the, 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 a lot of the crises we're in at present, the same as history, nothing's changed. They're caused by the othering of people. We make immigrants, for example, seem to be a dangerous other race, and so we feel able to let them die because we don't understand them to be like ourselves. Um, I mean, immigrants is just one example. All the, the crises and terrible things that are happening in the Middle East, there are different groups who have convinced themselves that the people they're killing are not like themselves. So, you understand that the exercise of art and writing and storytelling is actually an exercise in world building. What we're doing is trying to make a world where people, and this is what communication is all about, people know more about each other. And the opposite of that is the kind of uh, endeavor that trivializes and diminishes other people and that promotes conflict. We, have, we are having conflict promoted by what I think is sometimes called the Anglo-Saxon business model, the idea that competition is the only way to create wealth. I'm a great believer in the idea that cooperation creates wealth and cooperation creates society. When it comes to writing, any of you who are writers who work in the film business or want to work in the film business will very soon discover that it's cooperate or die. It is a collaborative industry. There are no successful egos in the film writing world. You will suffer if you attempt to say, I am the great creator, this is my work, you are all simply the people who are going to realize my dream. That's just not gonna happen. If you wanna do that, go and write a poem somewhere. And you can realize your dream by yourself and then you can put out your poem. And by the way, it could be an amazing poem. I'm not wanting to knock poems. But films are expensive things. They take a lot of money. A lot of people are investing in them. It is not about you. It's about the work that you create together with other people. And in the end, that's what I love about the film business. I also write novels. When I write novels, that is just me. But I think if I was only writing novels, I would have become a monster by now, particularly if I was very successful at it. Because if you just do the thing yourself and everybody claps, you start to believe your own publicity. And we all know what happens to people who believe their own publicity. Hollywood is full of them. They end up taking a lot of drugs, committing a lot of adultery, and then suicide. It's a sort of absolutely certain path, as far as I can see. And if you don't do that, your children will for you. So uh, I think the, the opposite, which is collaborate, cooperate, realize that you are one part of something. The vanity that I spoke about at the beginning, that little child dancing for his mother, you know, seriously, you can only do that for so long. There comes a point where you say, I'm not three anymore. Um, I, can, uh, I can be something better than that. Um, I, I think that, I do believe that writing, writing is a therapy, to be honest. It's a way of healing yourself. And any success that you have, any success that I've had, I feel is a bonus. 
The thing I'm proudest of in my writing life is that I've earned my living at it. There's something wonderful about being paid for writing. You know, if you write something and your mother says, but this is brilliant, you're so clever, which is what happened to me. When I was young, I thought, I am, it's true. I'm so clever. My mother said, I think you might be a genius. And I said, I think I might be too. And it takes a while for that to rub off, you know, and after which you notice that it's only your mother saying this. <laughs> Nobody else says it. People are polite. Mostly they're polite. But after that you don't believe any praise until it comes in the form of a check. <laughs> then you think, they're not going to give me money unless they mean it. They want something from me. I've got something they're willing to pay for. That is a beautiful, beautiful moment. There's something clean and pure about it. So I am very proud of having made a living as a writer, um, but I'm more proud of having gone on writing this long and grown to the extent that I have. I mean, you may find this unlikely, but I used to be, I had more hair, but I was much more immature um, in, in the past. Um, it is a difficult career to make a living at, I have to tell you. Those of you who want to do it, particularly the book, the book writing, even if you get published, I've now written a lot of novels, I could not live on my novels, at least. I couldn't live on my novels at the level that I live because I've had Hollywood money, if you see what I mean. So I have a country house and a London house and a swimming pool and children in private education, and all of this is because of Hollywood. But once you've bitten the apple, you know, and eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you can't go back. So I do carry on working to pay for that. Um, uh, for the rest of you, if you're just starting out, I'll tell you what's really good advice. Don't get a swimming pool. This is really <laughs> sound advice. It's a complete waste of money. It's terribly expensive. <laughs> Nobody ever swims in it. Don't get a swimming pool, don't get a big house, keep your outgoings low and you will be a free person. I have not succeeded in doing this. Um, but uh, if you want to make your career work, there's a very simple couple of tips. First tip, if you want to be a writer, you have to do something. This is the one thing you have to do to be a writer and a lot of people neglect to do it. You have to write. Now that may sound stupid, but endless people say, oh, I'm planning it, I'm working on it, I'm halfway there, I'm talking about it. That is absolutely no good. They say, I'm going to start as soon as I've got it all sorted in my mind. No, 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 no. Write every day, every single day. Because you have to get that muscle going, you have to get that discipline going. Second thing I would say is, do a day job. Because if you say, I'm a writer, and you're 20, that's fine. You're being a waitress to make a bit of money. That's fine. Then you're 30 and you say, I'm a writer. And you're doing a bit of teaching as a foreign language or something to keep you going. That's just about all right. Then you're 40 and you say, I'm a writer. And nobody's employing you anymore because you're looking a bit saggy. So it's beginning to get embarrassing, you know. And then there comes the point when you suddenly think, what if I'm not a writer? What happens then, and you've lost the last 20 years. Whereas, if you do a day job, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, two wonderful things happen. First of all, somebody pays you for something and you can survive. And secondly, you're actually engaging with the human race instead of sitting in a little cabin in the woods writing. So you've got something to write about. So I would suggest, keep the day job going. And the third thing is respond to feedback. You don't want to do this. I know you don't. You don't want to show anybody your writing because it's not good enough yet. Okay, and you're terrified. If you show it to them and you get the slightest scintilla of criticism, you will die, and you know that. So the only possible response to your writing is, this is so good, we're immediately going to sell it, send it to 20th Century Fox, and they're going to make it into a movie, and start planning your Oscar speech. That's the only, <laughs> only words you want to hear. But you've got to get over. 
You've got to get feedback to what you write, and you've got to understand that if the feedback is negative, that's okay, because that's what you're building on. That's the beginning. You will get better. It is a craft that you can get better at, but only if you get feedback. It's how everything works. It's how learning to play tennis works. You keep on playing tennis, and you keep on watching what happens to the ball when you hit it with your racket, and that's how your body learns. If you played tennis blindfold, you wouldn't learn nothing. So you have to have the feedback, absolutely imperative. So how do you deal with your fears? Very, very difficult. The only thing I can say is everybody around you is terrified as well, and they're hiding it, okay? If you can, get your friends to confess to you how terrified they are, that'll make you feel a bit better. Once you realize we're all terrified, it gets easier to cope with the fears, and it gets easier to show something, have people say, no, it's not working, go through all the agony of thinking, I must be a failure, I'll never be a writer, and then get back to work, because that's the cycle. So please, respond to feedback. And the, the final thing I want to say, and then we can have some, I, I'd be very happy to answer questions, which I'm sure will be much more useful to you, because you'll be able to specify what you want to know. The final thing I want to say is, this game of writing, or this game of films, or literature, or whatever you want to call it, Ultimately, and this is incredibly significant, I think, we are all in one business, and it is the pursuit of truth. We are trying to get closer to what is true. Around us is falseness. We're surrounded by false claims, by pretense, by people dressing up to be things they're not, by women whose tits are bigger than they really should be, by men who are trying to make out that they're more manly than they really are, by advertisements selling us stuff that are false. It's all, we're surrounded by lies. And how do we fight back against that? The politicians are lying to us the whole time, and we know that. How do we fight back against the lies? By telling each other true stories. And that is absolutely imperative if we're to believe in each other and in the goodness of people. And therefore, every single thing you do, whether you're writing as a screenwriter or as a novelist or as you're reading, as a, reading a book or watching a film, a little bit of you should be saying, is it true? Now, by that I don't mean, did it happen? I mean, does it resonate with me as, yes, I am receiving truth, I'm not being sold a lie. This is something real. And I think we all have a truth instinct in us, and we need to enhance it and make it more sensitive all the time, and we need to share it so that people realize that the truth matters. And for me, whether I'm reading Tolstoy writing about Russians 150 years ago, or whether I'm reading a science fiction novel today, a part of me is saying, do I believe this? Is this how people are? And when the answer is yes, something deeply satisfying happens to me. It's a feeling like I'm not alone. Back in Moscow in 1812 or in the 31st century, there are people like me experiencing the things I'm experiencing, struggling with the struggles I'm struggling with. There's a line that I wrote, I said this this morning, for my um, film of Shadowlands, I wrote it to create, it was part of a subplot that I was asked to create uh, when the, the central character of Shadowlands, who's an English professor, is having a tussle with a young student who doesn't understand the point of books. And uh, the hero, the professor, says to him, it's very simple, we read to know we're not alone. Now that line is not written by C.S. Lewis, it's written by me. So just tell that to anybody who's got that wrong. <laughs> We read to know we're not alone. I believe it, and I go to movies to know I'm not alone. I go to plays to know I'm not alone. Well, what I'm doing all the time is I'm saying, are there people out there feeling what I'm feeling, fearing what I'm fearing, loving what I'm loving? So I'm not a freak after all. I'm not alone after all. It's incredibly important. It's incredibly powerful. It is not just an academic discipline. It is your life. It's all of our lives. Um, so I'll stop there and invite questions. I, I don't know how we're going to do the questions, yeah, but yes. I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and listen. Somebody will translate if you can't yes. speak yes. English. Okay. Do it. Thank you.
been uh, extremely practical, but also, in my opinion, very profound, because we have gone to basic principles of uh, storytelling and the relation with our life. But as you have seen, uh, uh, William Nicholson has been also very, very, very practical. And uh, my experience of dealing with uh, young uh, writers or aspiring writers or uh, young screenwriters tells me that these are really effective and important and practical advices. So I suggest to take them <laughs> and to hear them uh, uh, in a very serious way. Now uh, we have uh, some minutes for uh, questions and answers. Just to encourage uh, everyone who wants to ask to be free, uh, as uh, he suggested uh, one minute ago, uh, you can also speak Italian, uh, we can translate uh, uh, the question into English and uh, he will answer. And uh, in the questions you can go from uh, the key basic general principles of writing, also if you have any curiosity about how it goes the process of writing or rewriting, because one of the uh, characteristics uh, of William Nicholson as a writer is that he has been involved uh, in many different projects, uh, as I was maybe mentioning at the beginning, in, uh, in various uh, uh, different ways of working. Uh, he has been uh, uh, rewriting a film by Black Vieto that was being shot uh, a few days ahead, or uh, he has been uh, working on some script that then is passed to some other writer, or he has been uh, working on a theatre play that, uh, on a TV uh, show that has been a theatre play that then that has been a film. So, and he has this uh, connection with the English, especially in the European industry and the American industry that is in uh, some sense unique. So, we can ask what we want. So, just stick up your hand if you want to ask something. Yes, yes there we are. Yes. First, I want to say thank you, Mr. Nathan, even at the, uh, the cheap seats over here. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate your uh, speaking. Second, I wanted to know, um, I'll speak part of the Red Seas a little bit. Um, what was the most challenging experience you had in your career? It's kind of a, a large question, but. <laughs> What was the most challenging um, experience of my career? I mean, th there's two answers. The, the, the most difficult for me has been the failures, when I get the phone call saying, you have been sacked. That's very, very hard. Um, and the only way I've known how to deal with it is to tell my family, including my kids, and they've grown up knowing that I'm in a very precarious business and I say, I'm feeling terrible, I just heard they don't want me on their project anymore, they're going to find somebody else, whoever that is. Uh, and in the early days, before I knew how much this happened, I found that very difficult. And um, so that's a sort of more personal. The, the, the most challenging thing I've ever done is the Mandela film, which I worked on for 16 years, and during that time it kept on not happening and not happening. Very, very difficult task because I was, in a sense, awestruck by the how to tell the story of a, a sort of living saint, or well, not living anymore, but he was then. Um, how to tell a very complex historical story, how to tell a very complex personal story, all in the space of one movie. And it was very, very difficult, but also very important to get it right. And I think that was the biggest challenge. The result is not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. And when the film comes out here, if you go and see it, I, I swear to you, you will be very moved. Um, I think it's a, a superb piece of work. Um, sadly, for me, when it came out last year, just a coincidence, but it came out at the same time as 12 Years a Slave, which is a wonderful film, uh, which rightly got all the plaudits it got, but I think we fell slightly into the, the shadow of that experience. So as it emerges in its own right, um, you know, if you go and see it uh, and think, as you watch, how would you have done that? How would you have told that story? And, and you know, you may think you would have done it differently. I did my best. Um, it took me a long time. 
And thank God I'm very proud of it, but I would say that's been my biggest challenge. Thank you. Another one. Oh, lots yeah. over here. Yeah, sorry, my question is a bit complex, but um, I wanted to ask you about Shadowlands. So you're open about this news because we are doing a course about retelling. So retelling stories or telling about stories about people that actually lived. So um, my question is not really about writing because I, I don't really write. But for example, translation, because I'm doing a work on Ulysses translation, for example. So I have to select from something that exists, what is important to me. But, uh, so the question also for you is like, how do you select from what you have in order to be faithful to, to the reality that you have in front of you? That's a very good question. I've done a lot of dramas about real people and the question as you articulated is exactly right. How do you decide what bits to show and what to leave out? You, the first thing to say is, when you're telling a story from real life, you are automatically, in a sense, falsifying reality. Reality is massive and complex, and the story you're going to tell is edited and managed, and has a beginning and a middle and end, so it's really a fiction created out of the reality. And how can one dare to do that with real people? I'll give you one little story. Shadowlands is the story of this English professor and his inability to love, his fear of loving, how he gets uh, drawn into love without realizing it's happening. The woman begins to die of cancer. He's suddenly afraid of losing her. He falls for her fully. He marries her as she's dying. She then comes back to life. She stops dying. And for three years they have a wonderful happy life and then she dies and he is shattered by it. This real story of the writer of the Narnia book, C.S. Lewis, does not include the fact that his two sons, he had two, sorry, the woman had two sons, uh, were in the real story. I used one son, only I basically sacked one of the, the kids. Um, but also, I have a scene which is in the end of both the play and the film which was critical to them. Lewis, the professor, is sitting in the attic with the boy after the boy's mother has died. The boy says to Lewis, do you believe in heaven? Lewis says, yes. He's a famous Christian, by the way, Lewis. The boy says, I don't. Lewis says, that's okay. And the boy says, but I sure would like to see her again. And Lewis starts to cry. And it's the first time he's cried. It's a very hinge important scene. So, after we'd shot this, this guy turns up in ankle length, shiny leather boots with a great big crucifix around his neck. And he says, and he's a man of about 60, he says, I'm the boy. I am Douglas. And I think, what? And then I realize, of course, why would he be dead? He was only eight in 1962. Of course, he said, I never thought to look him up. He's been in Tasmania all these years. And he's come over from Tasmania, he's read the script, he says it didn't happen like this, why are you writing this? I would never specifically have said, I do not believe in heaven, I've always believed in heaven, I believe passionately in heaven. You must immediately change the script, and I must answer when Lewis says, do you believe in heaven? I say, yes! And Douglas and Lewis say, so do I, and then they can both be happy, and the whole scene fails. So what do you do? So I said, I can't change it, sorry. So we didn't change it. Douglas, the real Douglas, eventually saw the film and he said, okay, I get it. I understand what you're doing. He said, everything in this film about my mother and stepfather is untrue, but it is the most true account of them that I have ever seen. Sort of weird paradoxical thing to say, but it absolutely expressed what in the end I feel is our duty to the truth, to the documentary truth, which is to capture the, the, the core truths in the limited space that we have. Um, I know that sounds like a weaselish thing to say, but I think that is our duty, because you can't kid yourself that you can tell the full truth ever, even if everything you show on screen is documented and a lawyer has been present and has seen that those words were spoken, you can still, by the process of selection, tell a false story. 
So your duty is not to the moment by moment truth, it's your, du your duty is to the overall truth. And the test for me is, could I sit in a room with that real person watching this film and be able to look them in the face? It's a sort of emotional on, on honor, if you like. It's really difficult. I've done a degree, I did it with Mandela. When Winnie Mandela saw the film, she's in it, she's a major character. She was very shaken by it, but at the end she said, that's okay. That'll do, you know? She realized we just can't tell everything. So when you're deciding what bits of translation do whatever, at the end of the day, you must make that decision and you must take responsibility for it. That's what it comes down to. You've got to imagine if Joyce came down from heaven and said, why have you chosen those bits to translate? You'd have an answer. Um, and I think that's what it's about. What you cannot do is fall back on a legal formula that says, oh, but I've documented that that happened. I used to make documentary films. Documentary films are as much fiction as anything else. They're constructs. Okay. Um, my question is about how do you think that your writing books for so long affected your screenwriting and vice versa? I mean, did you very seriously go back to writing books after you started screenwriting? And how do you think um, each style affected the other? What happened was, I, um, I was working as a screenwriter, I was doing very well, and uh, I became more and more frustrated by the lack of control, so I decided to write and direct my own movie, which I did, called Firelight. If you get a chance to see it, please do. I need to add my viewers up. You know, I've got four so far. Um, the movie did not... Amando has seen it, it's very nice. I have a DVD, I can... <laughs> the film failed. After it failed, I had a problem. What do I do? Do I go back to the world of screenwriting, which pays the money but frustrates me? And I decided I would go start again on books at which I had failed. And I decided to write children's books to stop myself from being pompous and pretentious in my writing. I'm an Eng English literature graduate from Cambridge saturated in the theory of English literature, all of which is a waste of time. You don't want any of that. What you want is to read naked, to read fresh, as if you've never read a book before. And so I thought, if I write for kids, that'll save me from trying to write in the subtext, you know? So I did, and that became very successful. I wrote a book called The Wind Singer, which has been uh, all over the world, and I wrote a series of these books, and that gave me the courage to go back into writing novels, which I now do with great happiness and, and pleasure. The difference between the two, Hollywood, not just Hollywood, all my film writing, I get so much criticism, you do if you write film, that it's taught to me a lot. And that knowledge has gone into my book writing. So the story craft that I've got from my film work, I've translated to my book work, and my books are now very good stories as well as being extremely profound and deep and well-written. But I wouldn't say that, wouldn't I? Um, so I do think that I've benefited hugely from the film work, but I have to tell you, the novels are where my heart is. That's where I can go as deep as I know how. That's where I'm a deep sea diver, it, it really is. And uh, when I'm long dead and the world suddenly wakes up to the fact that this great novelist has been in their midst all these years, They'll forget about Gladiator and things like that. And they'll start honoring my books. And I'll look down from heaven, in which I do not believe, saying, I'm really glad heaven exists, because now I can see. <laughs> um, you don't need to have, if you want to put up your hand and shout, that's fine. You don't need yes, to be, yes. to be this. Yes, we can hear. Who are you going to go to? Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't seen The Habit of Art, so I, I, what, what, can you sum up yeah, what the difference yeah. is?
Is what you mean that it's that it's more a kind of imagined? It's, it's imagined and it's also like the kind of uh, estrangement uh, the the spastic. So if uh, it is not the kind of uh, optic of of your shadow art, for example. No, I understand. Uh, but, but I haven't seen that particular one. But you know, there are so many different ways of of, of doing any form of, of, of theatre or any form of storytelling about real people who have once lived and they can all work and they can all fail um, I mean I, I've got as you can probably gather a very strong I suppose you'd call it value driven or morality driven um, way of looking at, at creative writing but that's only one way there are thank God all these other um, uh, ways of, of, of doing work which don't come under my um, style um, and which, on the whole, I don't read. I mean, I don't read detective stories, for example, which are all about very clever plots. I'm very resistant to magical realism because I find, except in the hands of some of the the best, the magical realism doesn't connect sufficiently with anything that I can get engaged by. It seems to me that it's just a bit silly. But that that's me. Um, so I think there are endless ways that any writer can tackle this stuff and the answer is does it work does it entertain, entertain people do they believe it did you believe it I don't just want to be told there are cruel people in the world. I know that. Um, I want to understand why they're cruel people. And if, I mean, Alan Bennett is, is a profoundly humane man, and I'm sure anything he writes about would, would have humanity at, at, at its core. He's also a very funny writer. Uh, um, I don't know if any of you know Alan Bennett, the English writer. He's an absolutely wonderful writer, extremely subtle and, and humorous. Um, but I'm sorry, I haven't seen that, so I can't really go any further on that. Another one. Yeah. Uh, about rewriting, uh, some people are saying that uh, uh, all these uh, remake sequel are the death of cinema because uh, we have nothing new to say, we have no new stories. That isn't true. We have a lot of new uh, original stories. And also, you this morning said that uh, we have to be ambitious we don't have to repeat ourselves, make a like it more be of course that, but uh, about rewriting, retelling stories, uh, uh, personally I think those are the best stories. Uh, about what you said, uh, this truth, this historical truth, uh, so gaining again this truth, uh, and I, I want to hear about your opinion. That's very really interesting. Um, you're quite right. Stories are retold the whole time, as we were saying at lunch. Shakespeare, nothing's original in Shakespeare, he was retelling stories that had been told before. And the Greeks were forever retelling stories. So it's, it, the point is not that we shouldn't retell stories, it's how we retell them. If you take Star Trek, I mean, I remember the original Star Trek series. I met Gene Rodenberry, who was the creator of Star Trek in my documentary days, and I remember him saying to me, the point of everything I'm doing in Star Trek is so that people say when they see somebody strange, his series was always full of strange monsters, always turned out to be like us. And that was his, his whole thing, you know, that uh, he wants people to say, you know, I met a Vietnamese the other day, and he's just like me. 
And that was his dream. So when they remake Star Trek now, I don't say to myself they shouldn't remake it. I say they're not doing it very well, which is a different point. I mean, there are some people who claim there are only seven stories in, in the world. I don't know what these seven stories are. But uh, I don't think we should worry about that. When I was talking this morning about Be Bold, what I meant was don't attempt to play safe when writing a film by simply saying the car chase worked in that film, the execution worked in that film, so I'll have one of that, I'll have one of that. Don't feel you've got to justify your plot decisions by saying, well, it worked in that other film. Uh, some executives will do that to you. Some executives reading your script will say, we need something great at the end, let's have a chase ending in a firefight, as happens in most action films. I wish somebody would say, yeah, it happens in most action films, and most action films aren't very good. So let's not end ours that way. So I'm only objecting to the kind of stale repetition, not using the stories that have been in us all along and will be in us forever. And actually, I think all great art builds on what's gone before all the time. Um, this sort of isn't anything new, really. What there is, is that same story told now, and it will be told differently now to the way it was told in 1986 or 1945. It just will. And, and that's, that's great. Okay? So, there was somebody with a hand up. Yeah. How do you make that work, your work? The adaptations? Yes. Like, uh, yes. You did Les Mis. I did Les Mis, yes. Uh, the, the work I did on Les Mis was designed to be invisible. It's a very popular show. 65 million people have seen it. It's not my job to take a superb, successful show and screw it up. My job is to take that show, make it look on screen as if you've it matches your memory of it from the theatre. But we have opportunities on screen that you don't have in the theatre. Obviously, we can go to locations, so we have to decide where to go. There are certain plot gaps which you may not have noticed when you saw the show, which we can fix. Certain character weaknesses that we can fix. But we have to fix them invisibly by bu building in little tiny bits of dialogue, little tiny extra scenes, which are then musicalized by the same team, everything was sung in Les Mis. And the, the theory is that you shouldn't even realize anything has changed. So my job was a craft job on that, and a job that demanded that I have very great respect for the original work, which I do have. I think it's a, a magnificent show. When I'm adapting something else, it depends how good I think it is. Um, if I'm adapting a, a, a fantasy book for a movie, and I think the book has got a really good central idea, but the rest of it is not very good. I'll just make up my own stuff. And they, they encourage me to do that. So if any of you write a book and sell the book to the movies to be adapted, don't expect it to come out the same way you wrote it. Because quite often I'm sent a book and I see that it's not very good. And they say, just make up some more stuff. So um, it's not very respectful of originals, the film business, unless it's a very famous original. When Harry Potter was turned into movies, there was such a fan base who knew the stories that they tried their best to, to stick to it. But mostly, nobody gives a damn, to be honest. Yeah. You want, you want to? Yeah. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you, like, how, how, did, how did you start again, not, not lose faith, mm -hmm. after for eight times no Good question. How did I keep going after rejecting, having eight novels rejected? Um, the answer is, oh, that happened between the age of 21 and 34, okay? Uh, I applied, I, I put work in for a couple of writing competitions in, in England, in London. One run by a magazine called The Spectator, one run by a newspaper called The Daily Telegraph, during those times, and I won both of them. So that made me think, maybe I'm okay. I mean, they were very small things. Um, but at least I, I thought, I'm not mad to want to be a writer. I wrote a radio play for BBC Radio, which was produced. And they asked me to write more, 
and I wrote more, and they were all rejected. But I got these little glimpses of encouragement. You can't manage with no encouragement. You need just a bit. So that was one way. The other way was, each novel that went down, I tried to analyze what I'd done wrong. Talked to my agent, thought about it. After the initial disappointment and pain, I thought, okay, I know what I've done wrong. The next book, I won't do that. But of course, what I didn't realize was there are many forms of error. And with each book, I was doing something else wrong. Um, but the main thing I was doing wrong was I was writing about stuff which was of great interest to me. And the most interesting thing about it to me was that it was me that was writing it. In other words, I was offering my own brilliance and wisdom. And I didn't have any brilliance and wisdom. I was too young, but I didn't know that. I was very arrogant, and that form of arrogance, I think it goes with being young. I thought the important thing was that I should write what is in me. What my agent should have said to me, but never did, was find a subject that other people want to know about, write about that as well as you can. You don't matter, write about that. And uh, I think I would have broken through then. I did, I did actually have one book published in the course of that, and the only reason they published it was because it had a lot of sex scenes in it, and they thought it would be terribly sexy. Unfortunately, because it was written by me, it also had lots of sort of religious scenes in it. So it was too sexy for the religious people and too religious for the sexy people. <laughs> Nobody bought it at all. Uh, and, you know, so I carried on with my BBC work. But if you see what I mean, I kept on thinking I was getting closer. Every single, you don't say to yourself, shall I write eight failed novels? You don't do that. You say, I will write one novel and it's brilliant. It doesn't work, but the next one will be. And that doesn't work, the next one will be. And you live in a sort of permanent state of hope. But it's hard. I mean, maybe there's a neurotic compulsion going on here. I mean, writers are deeply disturbed people, you know. Another question. Yes. The back. Just out of curiosity, how important is it for a writer to really experience what he writes about, uh, and how does he manage to do it? It's a very good question. Um, you can't, is the answer. I've written about people dying of cancer. I've never died of cancer. But <laughs> it's, it's an odd thing. As you learn to write, you learn an empathetic sensitivity which, if you're really good, I'm not saying I'm really good, but for the really good, take somebody like Tolstoy, you know, who's my god as a writer. How did that man know so much? How did he know what it felt like to be all those characters? Well, he knew quite a lot. He went to war, you know, which tells you quite a lot. Obviously, he lived on an estate with serfs and in Moscow and all that stuff. But how did he know what it felt like to be a young woman going to her first ball? And the only answer I can give is the way I do it. I soak in a lot of information. I write a lot in my novels. I write extensively about women and what it's like to be a woman. No, not just women, men as well, but about women. How do I get that information? And I'm told, and it's not just me making this up, that the women who read it say, how do you know that? That is what happens. I know it because I ask a lot of questions. I spend a lot of time talking to people, saying, Literally, what does it feel like? What's been happening to you? How is it? And if you do this enough, you build up an empathetic sense. You then imagine you are that person, and you write out of that. And sometimes it doesn't work. Um, I mean, if you think of the great writers, uh, somebody like Virginia Woolf in Mrs. Dalloway, I think there's a character in that who doesn't work because she doesn't know that, that working class sort of person. And it, for me, it doesn't work anyway. The rest of them do work. So you do your best, and you try your best. What you do not do is deceive yourself that by going and becoming a brain surgeon, you will know what it feels like to be a brain surgeon. Because first of all, you can't. And even if you go and sit with a brain surgeon, you can't. So you have to do it by this. It's a sort of magic when it, when it works, this sort of empathy. OK, another one? Have we got time? Yes. Simple question. Uh, yes. Have you ever had a writer's block, and if you had it, 
Yes, writer's block. Uh, I have actually never had writer's block because I know how to overcome it, and I will now tell you. First, you have to understand what is it that causes writer's block. The answer is your creative faculty is overwhelmed by your critical faculty. So there you are working creatively, and this little voice starts saying in your ear, why are you bothering to go on with this garbage? You know? And you think, God damn it, that's right. This is no good, and you give up. And you can't go on. So you have to shut up that voice, that critical voice. And here's how you do it. You're working away, suddenly, ah, you've stopped. Your brain has gone blank, you feel like you no longer believe in your project, and you've still got another three hours ahead of the session you've allocated to yourself to write. So what you do is you say, okay, I can't write anymore, my writing's no good, I've stopped, but what I'm going to do for tomorrow, when I may feel better, is I'm going to make some notes. This is not real writing. I'm just jotting down the sort of thing I would be writing if I was able to write, which I'm not. And as you jot these notes down, because they relate to what you've written up to now, they're not grammatical, they don't have punctuation, you just jot down these notes, just as a, an aid memoir for tomorrow. And I swear to you, in five minutes you'll be writing again. It's a very curious thing. It sort of just frees you from that perfectionism. And this is something I should say about writing in general. The enemy of good writing is good writing. Um, what you have to do is to get a bit dirty with it. Just relax and do it. Do it fast, do it easy. Don't be like Flaubert. Don't spend a week on a sentence. You can do that later. You can go back later and polish up your sentences and make it all sound like, you know, you're the king of style. That's all fine. Just get on with it. Get that stuff out there. And forgive yourself if it's not very good. Say, oh, well, who's to expect that? I'm probably not very good, but I'm enjoying it. I'm going to get on with it. And it's, I mean, actually, this isn't just true of writing. You know, this perfectionism is, is a crippling, crippling element of modern life. People who think that unless I do it perfectly, it's not worth doing. That is just nonsense. You know, you do it quite well and next time a bit better, and next time a bit better. You will never do it perfectly. You're not God. Okay. Uh, do you want to carry on? Okay, okay. Last, last question. Yes, last question. Thank you. Uh, sometimes uh, I got a feeling that in our generation we are a little bit cynical, or at least we pretend to be so. And so you, you spoke about compassion and about understanding. Do you think that storytelling can win over cynicism, or that uh, a storyteller just throws some seeds that will be, will be picked up by those who want? I am a great believer in the power of storytelling. Um, I, I, this may surprise you. I, I think our attitudes are formed by the, the mass of storytellers. So yes, I believe that the cynicism that currently exists, with much good reason, you know, we see what's happened to our financial system and our politicians and so on. Um, uh, but I think that the storytelling, there's been a bit of a tendency for a kind of cynical storytelling which people admire because they think it's more profound, because it's more negative. I don't agree with that. I think there is real negativity out there, but simply telling a story that is negative does not make it more real or deeper. The greater challenge is to find the, the, the good that, that's out there. But when you say, can we actually make a change through this? I, I often think back to the the value systems, the mores of, say, uh, America in the 50s, when I, America is such a pure case, they seem to be so available for propaganda. And there's something about the way all those Westerns functioned, which I love. In those old Westerns, they were constantly teaching you a message, which is you don't, you, you know, you don't hurt a lady, you don't hit a man when he's down, when you go to the gunfight, you give him a fair chance. You don't hide in a rooftop and shoot him with a rifle. You know? Now, all of that is nonsense. That's if you want to kill an enemy. You don't say, you get out on the street and I'll get out on the street and let's see who can shoot the fastest. 
I mean, that's not, I mean, that's far too dangerous. You might get killed. So you don't do that in reality, but in the story you do. So in the 50s, there was this whole generation growing up who'd been propagandized into a view of how people treat each other, which was of a fundamental honor. Now, a lot of it was nonsense, but it was powerful, and people internalized it, and they had it. I mean, I think back to the 19th century in my country, when the public schools, so-called public schools, which means private schools, were being created. And they were created to breed leaders to run the empire. And these boys were taken into these schools and told all these stories about how you are always a gentleman, you never tell a lie, you are never corrupt. You know? I mean, all of this is, is dreamland, but it worked. They all went out all across the world and they acted that way because they'd been propagandized that way. So I think rather than knocking it, we should join it. We should get out there and get our propaganda out there. I mean, I'm calling it propaganda, which seems cynical. I believe in it. It's, it's speaking up for what you believe in through stories. And I think you should not allow yourself to be sucked into the temptation of saying that you can make money telling nasty stories about nasty people behaving nastily. What is the point of that? You know? I think we should be proud, we should have high aspirations, we should want our world to be a better place, we should teach each other that we can love each other. And, you know, why not? I mean, what else is worth living for? Thank you. 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 Thank you.